All the configurations at this point have been made with the assumption that we have a known static IP for the inside global interface of the WAN. Uh, but there may be situations where this isn't known, specifically when you're getting a dynamic uh, WAN IP via DHCP and you have the option to specify the interface instead of the IP when setting up the NAT mappings. So if you were doing one like that, like say our, our last example, IP NAT inside source static UDP 192.168.1.50 port 53 and you can see you have an option of either the the IP this would be the uh, inside global address or the uh, the interface um, and since if it's a DHCP router we wouldn't know the IP so we would select interface and then specify the interface in this case serial zero and then the port number 53 so that's it for static NAT. We'll move on to configurations for dynamic NAT. Uh, dynamic NAT takes NAT to the next step and lets NAT perform the manual process of setting up translations automatically, similar to the way we were setting up those, uh, those static uh, entries uh, specifically. It allows you to find a pool of addresses to translate from and a pool of addresses to translate to. For instance, if a company merges with another and the two companies have the same uh, private IP subnet, very common, a uh, dynamic NAT can be used as a temporary solution to avoid the problems of overlapping IP space. See this all the time. Um, in, in this particular example, um, hosts that need to contact each other on each side would have to refer to each other by the host name instead of IP, which would require DNS. And then the NAT translation would be set up such that uh, IPs, when it, uh, it sees a reply from the remote DNS server, so the, the translation occurs you know, as it sees those replies from the DNS server and maps it to one of the other IPs in that, that dynamic NAT pool. Um, so, scenario three for dynamic NAT. In this scenario, we want hosts in the 192.168.1.0 slash 24 subnet to be translated to IPs 192.168.2.200 through 225 when accessing the 192.168.2.0 slash 24 block. And vice versa, we want a host in the 192.168.2.0 slash 24 subnet to be translated to 192.168.1.200 through 225 when trying to access the 192.168.1.0 slash 24 block. So 192.168.1.1 over here, 192.168.2.1 over here, and so we need to we need to set up those translations only whenever like these so, uh, clients are trying to access these or these are trying to access these. So, step one, we need to define the NAT inside and NAT outside interfaces as always. In this instance, both blocks are LANs, so we can just pick one or the other. Um, on the router, though, you'll see that uh, even though these are both LAN blocks, one of those is on a serial interface, the other one's on fast Ethernet. So I'm probably going to set this one as my outside interface just because logically, especially if I had a, a regular public LAN, this would always be my outside, so I'll just set it the same. Um, so. Interface fast Ethernet 0, IP NAT inside, exit out of there. Interface serial 0, IP NAT outside. Um, step 2, we must identify the NAT pool. Since we're translating in two directions, we need to configure two pools though. So, from global configuration, IP NAT, pool, and then you, you select a pool name and you, you can just set this as you want. So. In this case, we're going to call network1, network1 in all caps, IP NAT pool, network1, space, 192.168.1.200, and then you need to put in your, your end address, which is going to be .225. So IP NAT pool, network1, 192.168.1.200, 192.168.1.225, and you have the option of setting in a net mask or a prefix length. For the net mask, you would just uh, you know do net mask and then you know 255.255.255.0, uh, but you also have the option for prefix length. So in this this option, we chose prefix length, and it's going to be a slash 24. So the final uh, final statement is going to be IP NAT pool network one 192.168.1.200 192.168.1.225 for ending IP prefix dash length 24. First pool is configured. Now we got to do the same and create the second NAT pool. So statement is going to be the same, but for the other uh, the other block of IPs. So IP NAT pool network two one nine two dot one six eight dot two dot two hundred one nine two dot one six eight dot two dot two twenty five prefix length twenty four. Uh, so step three, we need to create two standard access lists that define the address ranges that will be uh, will need to be translated. 
So we're going to use standard access lists, and it doesn't look like we're using named access lists. So uh, access dash list, access list number 50, permit 192.168.1.0, and remember it's, uh, it's inverted subnet masks for your uh, reverse subnets. So 0 .0 0.0.255, and then for the other block, access dash list uh, number 51, permit 192.168.2.0, 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.255. So uh, we've defined those. Step number four, now we need to bring it all together and turn on the NAT translation. Start by translating from 192.168.1.0 slash 24 to the 192.168.2.0 slash 24 subnet. So statement's going to be IP NAT inside, because we're remember you can choose inside or outside, but we're going to keep doing it in the same direction to make things less confusing. So IP NAT inside source. And this time we're choosing a list since we created a, a group of IPs. IP NAT inside source list. And remember we identified those with ACL number 50, so that's that's why that's going there. IP NAT inside source list 50 pool. And it's going to pull to the second network, network 2. Uh, and then find, So that's actually going to be the final command. We're not going to use overload here. IP NAT inside source list uh, ACL number 50. Pool number or pool name network two. We finished by translating in the other direction from the 192.168.2.0 slash 24 subnet to the 192.168.1.0 slash 24 subnet. So uh, almost exactly the same as your your last command, only you're going to change the ACL number and your your pool name. So IP NAT outside source list 51 pool network one. Uh, you do see that the uh, inside outside does change since we're going in the opposite direction though. So uh, that completes dynamic NAT. Now we're going to move on to uh, everyone's favorite version of NAT, NAT overload or port address translation. Um, it's the most common implementation of NAT, and again I said everybody's favorite. NAT overload is used to map an entire pool of LAN IPs to a single LAN IP. So scenario number four, in this example we need to configure NAT overload so all of the LAN IPs can share the single WAN IP serial zero. Uh, additionally we will add two static NAT translations to point any request for HTTP and HTTPS ports 80 and 443 received on the inside global address so that the web server uh, 172.16.1.80 uh, can receive those requests. So it's actually, we're setting up NAT overload for Pat but it looks like these these extra little items here to forward these to this is actually setting up NAT overload and then setting up an instance or two instances of static NAT as well. Uh, to make things more complicated, we do not have a static LAN IP and instead we've got to specify that interface. So here's your network di uh, diagram. You've got your NAT router here. You've got a DHCP assigned uh, public IP from your service provider connecting to the public internet. And then you've got your, your LAN block over here and your web server that we're going to need to for ports 80 and 4432. Start by becoming familiar with the NAT interfaces again, um, and then identify, they're labeled pretty much the inside and outside. So show IP interface brief. You can see that you got fast Ethernet 0 for your LAN block 172.16.1.1. And currently, uh, remember it's, it's DHCP. Currently, serial zero, your WAN interface is pulling to 68.3.160.5. So now it's time to identify the, the interfaces for the NAT process. So config T, interface fast Ethernet zero, it's going to be the inside. So IP NAT inside, exit out of there, interface serial zero, IP NAT outside. So we got both of those labeled now. So now we need to identify the pool with an ACL. So um, in this case, uh, we're actually going to use a, a named access list. Uh, IP access dash list standard and then our name is going to be internal underscore addresses and then once you you see that once we identify that it's a standard ACL and put in the name it jumps us into configuration mode for the uh, the named ACL so we just need our, our permit statement uh, permit 172.16.0.0 uh, inverted subnet of 0.0.255.255 .0 .0 .255. And that's just going to be the only permit statement we need because we're just identifying the, the full uh, LAN block. Remember, it's got a, an, explicit, an implicit deny command uh, after this permit statement. 